Yeah. So that was a really great demo. Uh, I'm Josh, I work at Terminal.com. Uh, we help power that demo. Obviously you can run Prediction I.O. on whatever infrastructure you like, but we think that we're one of the better ones, and today I'm going to talk to you about what we do and what makes us a little bit different from the other providers. So Terminal is the fastest secure Linux cloud, and I'm going to explain what that means because I understand that that's a big claim. And so what we work on here is next generation virtualization. And I can talk about that in, in much more specifics, but I think that through, the, through this talk, you'll have a good understanding at the end of it of what I'm actually talking about. Because that's sort of a nebulous term. Uh, first thing I want to cover is that there's a lot of people that make Terminal possible. If you look around, many of them are in the room right now. Uh, they're, they're good people, they've done a lot of hard things. So if you want to know more about them, you can go to terminal.com slash about. Uh, we have a lot of engineers here that are working on hard problems and we want to share the results of their labor with you. So, what we think about a lot is the sort of idea of the software defined data center, being able to not really worry about the underlying metal that you're working on and just get your software done. You don't really want to have to deal with the fact that you know one server has four cores, another is 32, and migrating across them is kind of a pain. Like, you don't want to deal with images and, and all and rebooting and kernel patches and all that kind of stuff. It's just not stuff that you want to deal with. You just want to write code and you want to like run it and that's it. And so that is the vision of what we're trying to deliver. We want to deliver a data center that just takes care of all that stuff for you so you can get back to writing code. So we think that in order to do that, you really need a very secure and fast virtualization implementation. We think that you need a software-defined networking layer, which again is sort of an endless term, but I'll talk about that in more detail in just a second. And we think that you need a custom distributed storage layer. We don't think ZFS will cut it, and so we wrote our own. Uh, so Terminal is built for, again, security, reliability, and performance. So what makes Terminal different? Terminal is really powerful. You can do anything you can do on your native Linux box on Terminal. It, you have root, you have the ability to open up ports. It is essentially a Linux box that is just yours in the cloud. It also functions like your laptop in that you can pause services and then resume them just like closing and opening your laptop lid. So it's really, really, really fast. They, they load uh, incredibly quickly. I'll show you a couple different demos. I'm gonna show you loading a CentOS box and resizing it. I'm gonna show you deploying an Apache Spark cluster. And I'm gonna show you that both of those things happen very, very, very quickly. We also deploy prediction IO as well, just for fun. Uh, last, Terminal is really secure. So we, do, we have a thing called snapshotting, which you, if you're familiar with VMware land, that's a, is a term that they popularized, but we think we do it a little bit better in that we don't really deprecate performance on your machine while we're snapshotting. And the terminals have exactly the same security profile as bare metal, uh, in that you can secure them however you would like to. And we think that there is a lot of strong guarantees that we can give you that other companies can't. So in talking about the differentiation, when you think about VMware as a hypervisor, they're secure, but they're kind of heavy. And they don't particularly boot very fast. And they also emulate the kernel, so they're sort of large, and they don't get to benefit from any of the Linux kernel scheduling advantages. Docker containers are fast and small, but they're insecure, and they require, they require you change your workflow pretty significantly. Terminals have all the benefits of hypervisor with the speed and performance of container. And if you really like Docker and Docker files and those kinds of things, you can just run them on top of Terminal. And so I thought that this grid would be a great way to compare what the different services that are offered. And I think that the differentiation is really important. Everybody's got local CPU performance, but having a cloud and cluster stored in live migration is a thing that I think is hard to implement on Docker right now. And it's a thing that we have. And I think that fast startup and compactness are things that VMware cannot get to because of their choice of architecture and their design decisions. Uh, lastly, snapshots and security are hard things. We'll talk a little bit more about what that actually means. We do a lot of stuff in a very, very, uh, what I would describe, interesting way. So how Terminal fits in? It runs on commodity hardware. It has automatic networking, distributed storage, and provisions in seconds. You can run this inside of another hypervisor. You can run it on bare metal. It's just whatever you want to do and whatever your needs are as a business. But you can run this inside of Amazon, Google, or Azure. Or you can just run it in your bare metal if that's what you want to do. Either one is fine. So who uses Terminal? We launched in December, and we already have tens of thousands of people using our public cloud. We have a lot of private cloud installs, but most of them are not public. Uh, I can tell you that Crunchbase uses us and runs us for their production system. And uh, they actually have a pretty complicated application involving a graph database, lots of Redis instances. They got a lot going on. So you can stand up really a lot of stuff really quickly. It's also very good for QAing your applications. So if you want to have a cluster that has a somewhat complex setup, you can snapshot all those machines at a given point and then restore to that point. 
And so that makes debugging a lot faster. You don't have to waste a lot of time getting your machine back to initial state. You can just press a button and now your machine is back in initial state. So I'm going to show you a demo of what this looks like. And this will be a really short, quick demo. So I'm going to go to terminal.com. I'm going to go make a CentOS box. I'm going to start this out with two CPUs and a quarter gig of RAM and 10 gigabytes on disk. We're going to go ahead and start. And this will take just a few seconds, and then I'll have a full CentOS box with root that's provisioned and ready for me to basically go to town on it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run top to show you that I actually have 256 megabytes allocated. So let's go ahead and do that. You can see right here there's roughly 256 megabytes. It'd be really great if I had, you know, like 6.4 gigs. And normally that's sort of tedious to get to. It, it, you'd have to, you know, image your machine and go start another box that's bigger and then move your image over. And that, that sounds like a lot of work. So what would really be nice is if you could just click this button, hit the extra large button, hit save, and wait a couple seconds and have 6.4 gigs of memory. <laughs> and so that's just what terminal does. And there's a lot of magic behind that to make that happen. The other thing that we can do is go back down. So let's go ahead and do that. So you go back down, and you'll notice we're back to 256 megabytes. And I think down is a bit harder than up for lots of reasons. Uh, if you guys play around with computers, you understand why. Um, but we, we just handle it. Obviously, if your application isn't going to fit in memory, it's going to have a failure if you resize to a memory footprint that's below what's running in your actual machine. Um, but you, you can resize only one. And it's really, really, really fast. So what's happening there is that we're running a check on the actual physical machine to see whether we have the available resources. If we don't have the available resources, we just live migrate your machine to another box. And they both happen so fast that I actually have no idea whether this just did this on the same box or whether we actually live migrated. Hmm. In addition, Terminal is constantly auto-rebalancing, and so users are just being moved arbitrarily all the time because that is the most optimal way to utilize your cluster. And so Terminal just does that for you. It's not a thing you have to think about anymore. And so that is very useful for lots of things. I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how we manage state. So here, I've got top running. I'm going to go ahead and pause this terminal. And you'll notice on the right that the billing stopped. Uh, I don't know if you can see it too well, but this says zero. And so this, this machine state has been stored, and we're going to restore machine state, and it'll start billing again. And when I go back into the machine, you'll see that top is still running. And I will demonstrate that with an Apache Spark cluster in a second to show you that we can boot to an Apache Spark cluster that just still has your data set in memory. So here you can see. Top is still running. So I paused the machine, I came back to it, and it's still at the exact same machine state that I left it. So let's go ahead and boot up an Apache Spark cluster. So if you've ever wanted to test Spark out, there might, might be something in your way, like it, it, it's too tedious to get it up and running, you don't really want to mess with it. This is going to take a little bit longer than the other one because there's a little bit more RAM to restore. Uh, the, the limitation on RAM is literally the drive read speed. So as long as there's on a fast drive, it should read really fast. In theory, on the uh, SSD, it's one gigabyte or one gig, yeah, one gigabyte per second. So now you can see Spark, and it's got a data set of memory. So that is the fastest way that I can think of to test Spark. If you can find a faster way to get Spark up and running, please do let me know. <laughs> so that, that is the terminal demo. Uh, I can answer lots of questions about it in a second, but I'm going to get back to the presentation and show you guys a little bit more about what's going on. So, and we begin again. So let's talk about the value proposition. Why are we doing this thing that we're doing? Because this is, this is a non-trivial amount of work. There's got to be a reason why people build something like this. So we think that this is the future of computing. We think this is the best possible computing experience that you can deliver to people. And we're going to continue to work in that vector as long as we can. We think that it makes a very sensible and compelling financial case, as I just showed you, if we're able to stop computers and also not build. And if you are running your own cluster, the only thing you're paying for to preserve state is disk. And that's a pretty big deal. You no longer have to leave those machines running all night just to get back to the same state. And for those of you who have left your Amazon machines running for an entire month and then gotten a big bill, you know what that feeling is like. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. So from, the, from a technical perspective, we allow you to deploy software securely, securely and reliably. So when you deploy software in terminal, you're deploying a snapshot, and that snapshot is at a given machine state. And so you don't have to run startup scripts, you don't have to run configuration, you just press the button and now the machine is running. And so you can deliver an extremely consistent experience to your users. Uh, we have, again, ran perfect snapshots. So if you want to do QA testing, all you have to do is snapshot your environment at an initial state, and then you can test over and over and over again. 
<coughs> the system is self-balancing, self-healing, and auto-scaling. So if you need, if you want to have it where if you hit a certain CPU threshold, the, the machine automatically expands, that is trivial to do on terminal. So we think that using terminal, you can do computing just a bit faster. In terms of financial, developers get more done when they don't have to wait for things. Waiting sucks, nobody likes to wait. Your time is valuable, and we think that you shouldn't waste any seconds or minutes of your life deploying things that, oh God, I didn't have the right dependency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This saves a crazy amount of time. In particular, in QA, you never have to get, again, back to that initial state. You can just press a button and the machine back to the initial state. The servers run at very high utilization because this is virtualization and we can jam a lot of boxes on there. And in addition, we're doing actual disk and RAM deduplication, so you can jam a lot of things onto one box. And finally, you can turn off the servers when they're not in use, so there's a bit of green technology here. So we think that it makes a lot of sense from a financial perspective as well. It's not just raw performance and speed, it's also a sensible financial decision to use terminal. And last, we think that DevOps is actually what's holding back data science, not the algorithms. Because you, again, you can write a lot of algorithms, but it is really hard to get a cluster up and like test the cluster and do test and all, do all the QA stuff. It's just hard. And so if we can make that a little bit easier so everybody can get back to writing algorithms, that would be the absolute best outcome from this project. Um, an automatic cloud means that you don't have to spend a lot of time doing DevOps. You can move your machines back and forth. You can take down a machine without harming any of your applications. You can upgrade your kernel with security patches without taking down your application. So every time that Amazon Web Services sends you that super annoying email that says in three hours Doom is coming and your, ser your server is going to reboot, you can say, I don't care, I'm on terminal, I don't need to worry about it, we'll just auto-migrate. Finally, we have security the second event. So we run a container implementation that is not libcontainer or LXC, it is our own custom container implementation. It's been tested by a number of security experts for about 18 months with zero container breakout, and we are the only container implementation that can say that at this time. So we think that we have a first-class security story as well. So we think that in totality, Terminal is actually the only differentiated virtualization and cloud product. So in summary, Terminal is the fastest way to do computing. If you know a faster way to, to do it, please do let me know. I'd be very entertained to see it. Using Terminal, anybody can run anything they want really fast with strong reliability and security guarantees. And so if you want to sign up, you can go to Terminal.com right now and do exactly what I just did, because that's literally what I did for the demo. You can go to Terminal.com and spin up a CentOS box or Ubuntu or whatever flavor of Linux you want. And if you have questions about SLAs, private installs, or enterprise accounts, you can email me at josh at Terminal.com. And so that's my presentation. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer whatever you can throw at me. Yes, sir. If you lie and spin up another instance, are you using the RAM snapshot to reproduce exactly the state? In the so, next. yeah, so you, you basically are, you commit the state to disk and then you stream the state from your disk. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so you basically invented the way of downloading more RAM or more calls. That's not impressive. Well, well we, we allow people to reuse the same RAM for multiple instances. So if you have like 100 CentOS boxes that are all at the base install, they actually only take up the space of one CentOS install. So what, uh, what actually happens when you add more calls? Is your instance uh, pausing or does, what does it do? No, no, when you, when you add more cores, uh, let's say like you want to add 32 cores. The biggest machine that we have right now is 32 cores. So we migrate you to a 32 core machine and that's just your box. So you can't get 50 cores? Uh, you can get 50 cores if you have a box that has 50 cores. I don't right now, but if you want to give me a high density blade, I'd be happy to migrate you to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to get a box with 50 cores. Um, I mean, you, we definitely are working on some high performance computing stuff where we work with diskless systems and they get to much higher density. But generally, uh, needing more than 32 cores usually means you should do some horizontal scaling. Yes, sir. Um, so, did you say that you're doing memory sharing across machines? We're not doing memory sharing across machines. We're doing memory sharing across instances on the same machine. Yeah, memory sharing across machines would be quite the feat. Quite the feat. Yes, sir. What about this sharing? One of the problem I have on Amazon is NAS storage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, what are you asking? Are you asking? Uh, can I share my my disk across multiple instances? Yeah, I mean, you, you absolutely can. So we wrote a custom block level file system. And so anytime that you snapshot, we basically replicate to three different uh, copies. Mm -hmm. And those are all sharded across. And we, I think we offer like something like six or seven nines of guarantees on that. 
Um, but if you want to share storage, that's something that we can certainly do as well. You can run any file system. You can run NFS, you can run ZFS. We pre built in without running any extra uh, NFS, anything on public? Um, I actually don't know. That's a good question. Uh, Jeff, do you happen to know if we can run distributed storage, like shared storage by default? We don't have any. <laughs> You totally do it, we just haven't done it yet. There's a lot There's a lot of stuff on the roadmap because when you're tackling a problem that looks like this, there's just a bajillion things to knock out. Yes, sir? Can you want to scale on RAM versus yeah. like Redis running and yes. Yes. Yep, you can do detection. Yeah. You can just do detection. In fact, you can miss events in between. So you are not going to miss events in between. We actually demoed this at Redis Conf last week. How, how come? Yeah. Uh, so, you mentioned having distributed block device. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when you're running an instance, is that running on, is that a new kind of mounted disk or block Yeah, so there's a block device that's mounted, and then we, when you snapshot, we replicate it to uh, many different places. Okay. Yeah, but your storage is totally ephemeral until you snapshot. So that's an important detail. Yes, sir. All right, so as part of my job, I end up sitting on risk committee meetings. Yeah. Which is something people are sort of been nibbling at of what is the failure mode, because there is one, right? You can't guarantee uh, process level switching on the same machine, the same memory, and moving over to a faster processor in every instance with no loss of speed, no matter what. Right, I don't think. I, I don't know. Because unless, unless you can anticipate the instant slam of needing you know, all of a sudden more memory on two different instances, and then pick the right one to move over to the new machine and nothing slows down whatsoever, that'd be hard, right? There's, there's gotta be a failure mode somewhere. I haven't seen it yet. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen it yet. So I, I can dig into that and get back to you on that, but I have not okay. seen it yet. Yeah, I mean, everything we've thrown at it so far is just to try to handle it. <laughs> um, let's say you're 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 guaranteeing some uh, threshold of response on and users hitting your site, right? Users hitting a, a particular instance, and uh, while let's say the demand doubles on two instances at once, running on the same machine or sharing the sharing the same box. Okay, so the guarantee that we don't have is that the resizing happens. Right. So there will be no downtime, but it could be a little bit of time before it actually gets all the new RAM. Done. Got it. That that makes total sense. Okay. Can I just follow up on that? Yeah. Right. So you have a six gig instance, uh, and now you have to move it to somewhere else because you do six gig six times move. So now you're blocked on that time period. So you can yeah you can still do things. It's continuously. But you won't get the twelve gigs or whatever you need. But you don't, I mean. You don't, if you have latency, you don't have downtime. Yeah. Right. Right. The six gig is still running. No, but it, it is. But, it, but if you need, if you want state to be, you don't have to be consistent. You may be in luck and you may be out of time. So yeah. this, this question is about the latency from migrating between physical devices. So it's, okay, so when you change from six to 12, um, until, like, it'll be some small amount of time until basically six gigs and how bad you can transport that over the network, which is about six but, seconds. But don't you have, a, you, have a, you have a consistent image that yeah. you're, that you that can't change? Oh, no, no, we sync it at the end. Yes. Okay. It's, 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 you don't, there's no inconsistency. Like it's it's different. In the, I right? see, okay. It's, it's, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like subversion, Okay. right? Okay. Subversion okay. at the op OS level, that's the record. Right. Right. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. That's the nifty ass thing. <laughs> <laughs> so how fast can you sync? Basically, the network connection goes and drops. So 
Yeah, I mean, we can also live migrate continuously without actually moving the IP address over, <laughs> so that in the event of a failure, you just slam the IP address over and then the box is back up. Yes, sir. What's the what's the overhead you're paying for your transient memory management? The overhead we're paying is super low. Uh, do you have do you have a number for the, the memory overhead? It's like fifteen percent for there's no RAM overhead for this. In fact, yeah, the performance overhead. Though. There's no performance. Overhead. It's it's like 05 percent. But it's like it's like probably, yeah. It's not 25 percent like VMware. Okay. Well, that's 15 percent. Yeah, a lot of engineering. <laughs> a lot of engineering. <laughs> Are patents pending, or are you guys, <laughs> are you guys keeping this quiet? Uh, that's that's a great question. Uh, Varun, do we have a stance on patents? We're we're from the file. <laughs> <laughs> we just like to do stuff. <laughs> Any more questions? I, I can, I'm happy to answer whatever you guys want to throw at us. I mean, we, it's a lot of work. Yes, sir. In the uh, reference production uh, customer? Yeah, I mean, Crunchbase is running this in production, in and production. there's a lot of academics that are running this in production. Code Academy um, also. Yeah, Code Academy is also running us as their back end for basically everything we're doing. Yes, sir. So, Josh, you said that um, the, that, I don't know, advancement is, is uh, constrained by DevOps. Yeah. Um, and actually, about what we're dealing with here are still virtual slices, a new a new swing end maybe. But you know, you still have to install your Redis, uh, whatever. You know, you, you have to still do a lot of. You still have to get to an initial state, but you never have to get back to that initial state again. So I'm wondering if there's um, if you guys are doing anything at at a higher level at the application layer level. Or yeah, so we're going to do a ton of stuff at the application layer level, but we have not done it yet. We thought that the low-level stuff was important to knock out first, and then we get to the application stuff as we go. But we have a lot of plans. Um, this is this is just the beginning of the stuff that we're working on. There's a lot of features in the pipeline that will help you do a lot of things in the application layer. Um, we think of the, sorry. Like if one person installs Redis, they can make a snapshot and then share a video, so you don't have to. Yeah. So in that sense. Yeah, somebody installed Spark once, now everyone has Spark. You can also snapshot groups and then start them all up at the same time. So yes, sir. I mean, that's is it possible so that to import VM? Uh, is it possible to import VM? Is it possible? Yeah, I think it is. I don't know that we've actually written a tool to do it automatically, but you can definitely import VMs into the system. Um, it might require us to write some additional code to be able to do it, but you should be able to do it, no problem. Something you mentioned that I think might be of interest, given the line of questioning, yeah. was that um, so somebody installs Redis. Uh, they say, hey, use this. They, they take it and they both make changes. Do you have a diff tool that makes it easy to sort of sync back together? Yeah, so it, you basically fork them. Uh, right. you know, so we, we can tell that like this version of Redis is different than this other version of Redis, and when you, when you snapshot it, then it's uh, in the hierarchical, model, the hierarchical model, it is a fork. But you can bring them back together again. We don't have merge uh, yet. Yeah, right. we, don't we, don't have merge. Okay. we don't have merge to compare, but yeah. it's, a, it's a, something we've been talking about. Sure. It's, it's hard for a lot of reasons. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you have an API that automates some of the yeah. creation of instances? Yes. Everything is in an API. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's a ton of stuff in here. So uh, you can do everything from spin up an image, cause uh, uh, machines to link together, uh, check your balance. Everything is just available. Obviously, this white background isn't helping through too much. But I, I swear it's all there. You can just go to turbo.com slash API. And, yeah. and is it integrated with any config management tools? Uh, so we haven't done any config management tool stuff yet, but you can certainly integrate this with Ansible and Shadow and things like that. Um, we'll probably get around to doing that at some point. Yes, sir. Um, you talked about self by networking. Yeah. Um, that's your way in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, on our system, all of the machines have a private IP address, and all the machines of a given user automatically talk to each other. And then you can define groups and access rules. Uh, actually, let me just show you that. So here we have share access. This isn't for linking machines together. This is for exposing. Uh, yeah, sorry for the wall, guys. But uh, if, if you trust me, you can just uh, type a user's email address and then tell them what ports or whether the ID and whatever they can access, and just allow them to access that uh, programmatically. So then, you know, any, anybody that if someone has an account on terminal, you can expose access to your terminal very easily. Um, in terms of linking the machines together. All of the machines that are yours are automatically linked together, and if you want to expose them, you make a terminal link, which is an API command. You have to explicitly say that this machine can talk to this other machine on this port, yeah. so that, but then, then they can talk to each other. Yeah. 
And so we handle all of the nastiness that is related to making containers talk to each other. Like, I don't know if you guys have tried to do containers in production, but the networking and the storage are really hard, and those are the problems that we focus on. Yes, sir? Is there visibility into what the actual physical relationship is between two machines? Because some, some versions of... Yeah, so yeah. everything is rack aware. Uh, we have a rack aware file system, so we know basically wh what machine you're running on and where the closest images are to the screen the fastest. No, no, I, I mean, you have two machines up. There's a lot of algorithms depend on what is your latency assumption between sure. the machines. And if your latency assumption is, well, actually all these processes are running on the same physical machine, great. But if they're far away from each other, not so great. And so you, for some of these algorithms, you sort of need to know what the inter-machine latency is. Yeah. Can't explicitly right now say, start these two up on the same machine yet. Um, it's very easy for us to do. I mean, there is a secret way of doing it, but there's no explicit way to do it. We're, 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 we're nearby, for some yeah. definition of nearby. They're all really nearby because they're all, like, for a given user, they're all on the same rack. Ah. So that, at least you know that much. Yeah, um, we, we plan to be able to bind those two specific machines or, or group all uh, users' machines together in some way. Um, but there, there's a lot of stuff to do. It's hard to get everything done at once. Yes, sir. So tell me if this is getting too much into the weeds of like a no, no. Um, So I often care about having my processes run on different machines. Yeah. Um, is that going to be available? Uh, what, what, what are you asking specifically? Like, um, I like having I like having my assigned cluster running on different physical boxes. So one one for each end. What? Why do you care? Um, if I put if I put critical if I have a distributed system, normally yeah. I'm distributing it for one of two reasons: one for performance, one for reliability. I see. So you want to be able to say like, I want my MySQL instance to run three physical locations. Yeah. yeah. So we don't have that functionality today, but we will have that very shortly. And that is definitely like pinning an uh, instance to a particular geographic area. We understand why you want that, and we will enable you to do that shortly. Yeah. It's an important detail. You know, like if, if Amazon East falls off the side of the world, you don't want to uh, lose everything. That's not how you want the world to go. So yeah, I definitely empathize with that. We'll be bringing that feature shortly. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Compliance requirement, PCI, uh, SOX, any of those? Yeah, that? so I, I find that most of those requirements come down to where you post and like what the physical metal looks like. And so those are those are really more infrastructure questions. In terms of, from a software perspective, we're compliant with just about everything. Um, you know, like I, I don't actually know what the HIPAA compliance regulations are in relation to containers versus VMs, but I'm fairly certain that they're not that nuanced. I think that it's basically just the metal. And like for a hip for a hip application, you just have to be on your own metal. But you just don't have any pre. I can't just say they already PCI certified. That's it. We so we are right now are hosting an SAE sixteen data centers, and they have all the certifications that you need to do this. So you could, in theory, do this. But if you wanted to actually like have a HIPAA logo, we would probably charge you more money and put you on a different metal. Yeah, but it's certainly something we can do. Okay, so how much danger is there that the pharma companies are going to realize that and pay you enough money that uh, you stop supporting everyone else? How much money is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If you, call, if you call the pharma companies this week, they're pretty unhappy. So well, I might no, be happy to chat with them. I, I just don't think that they'd be able to write a number that would make us stop supporting how many? Companies. How many billions do you need? <laughs> enough. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's always a price, right? Like, you just have to figure out what the model is to make sense of that price. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so if, if you have, uh, if you're trying to migrate your machine to do small, they'll just build a migration and tell you, like, hey, what are you doing? You can't do that. Is there kind of your roadmap to like, what is possible kind of streamline the process? So the disk, the only, the major obstacle is disk. If you try to reduce RAM, it will kill processes randomly, especially yeah. when you get to enough RAM. So primarily it's disk. But it won't do it, right? It'll give you an error first and say, we won't do this. Uh, sometimes it, it's, it's, <laughs> an, it's an option that we can set. I see. It, it, you have to tell us what you want. We don't know. Some people want to just have it happen, and some people want to have it controlled. Because you can obviously check your own RAM before you attempt to do that. But we can, of course, do it for you and tell you. But you can say, are you just doing it a high number to low number on PIDs? <laughs> 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 you, you, you tell off the high PIDs oh, yeah. to go down? 
is I don't want that number one to die. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a priority scale, but yeah, it's something like that. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, we've got a little bit of beer and a little bit of pizza left. If you guys can help me get rid of it, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you again to Prediction Night. You guys did great. And this has been wonderful. <laughs> you guys have